Well, thank you, Council, for uh, some patience tonight while I was waiting for my agenda. Uh, that being said, we'll now call the June 22nd regular meeting of Council to order 758. So first item on the agenda is 2.1, adoption of this evening's agenda. Councilor Blanchett, Councilor Pearson, any additions? Hearing none, all in favor? Nobody wants to add anything? One day. <laughs> Item 3. Point, uh, all in favor? Thank you. Carried. Item 3.1, adoption of the minutes of the June 18th, 2021 regular meeting of the council as presented. Councillor McLean, Councillor Blanchett, any errors or omissions arising? All in favor? Carried. We do have a couple of delegations under section four this evening and it's uh, first one under 4.1 we have stormy lake consulting giving us a rundown on tourism Vailmount government governance structure okay was that our lead-in that's your lead-in the floor is yours good sir <laughs> thank you very much uh, so my name is Philip Coppard and my colleague Ray Freeman is uh, joining us and we're very pleased to share with you the results of some work we've been doing over the last few months through the community looking into tourism and tourism strategy and one of the key elements of that was recommendations around the most constructive and useful governance looking forward. So I'm going to let Ray run you through a few thoughts and then we can have a discussion. Thank you Philip. I'm just going to share my screen here. Great. Well, uh, Mayor and Council, thank you for your time this evening. Um, so uh, one of the uh, priority actions of the whole update in the strategic plan uh, and activities was to look at and analyze options for the governance functions for the uh, tourism, tourism veil mount uh, activities. And uh, priority was to establish what we call a high functioning marketing position. And this is um, designed to really be dedicated and focused on tourism. Some of the key uh, feedback and, and issues or questions that were arised uh, were the need to have some autonomy to meet the needs of the tourism industry, businesses and stakeholders in the community. Um, and have this accountable and reliable to a, a governing board of directors. Uh, however, it also needs to really maintain strong lines of communication with council. Uh, there's a, uh, a long history of there of the committee of council operating the tourism function there. Uh, but uh, we've gone through a bit of an exploratory process to show best practices uh, in the current situations and moving forward. So. Here's a little bit of a, a quick overview of the functions um, of a destination management organization. And I use the word management because the intention here is to uh, it's have it a more comprehensive look beyond just advertising, just marketing and promotion. Uh, this is marketing is usually the first thing we think about. Uh, it actually starts in the bottom corner and generally goes clockwise. So we need to have good leadership, coordination and collaboration um, and that leadership would then focus on uh, understanding the market opportunity or challenges, the, the uniqueness of the situation in Vail Mount, uh, what the market research is, and uh, anticipating where the puck is going, so to speak. Uh, you know, what's our trends, what's our opportunities. Um, and of course, in the last 18 months or so, things have been uh, a little bit unclear, but we know that uh, tourism is going to be uh, coming back quite strongly particularly for the types of experiences that uh, Velmont is known for. Um, product development is really about um, improving the quality of the tourism experience for our, our targeted visitors. And, uh, and then of course, getting the word out through the network. And, uh, you know, the, the, the network is, is quite powerful. You know, we can have tourism Velmont working collectively with the regional destination management organizations who are then the channel to the province through destination BC and then ultimately destination Canada to our international visitors. So a small independent 
business operator in Vailmount has global reach using this this network. Um, partnerships and team building, it really it's about collaboration and building sort of equity together. And then the community, um, you know, the, the concerns of the community, the needs of the community are need to be reflected in any, any strategy roles. I'm gonna go through these fairly quickly. So uh, this is sort of the functional areas of the DMO, really uh, into that, the marketing communications, trying to develop media events, using those channels like travel, trade, travel and lifestyle media and content marketing. Um, enhancing visitor services to make sure that we are not only anticipating what visitors need, but helping to capture their attention, secure their, their bookings, and then deliver their services that they require for information uh, when they're on the ground in the community. Um, industry development, so that's building capacity for the businesses, um, because many of them, uh, some of them are startups and, and may not have uh, experience uh, that community engagement activities. And then the bottom one really uh, destination management. So it's all about economic sustainability, supporting our businesses, supporting the community and our community partners and uh, environmental impacts. And those uh, need to be weaved into sort of every decision that we make. The other piece here to understand is <clears throat> having an empathetic view of all of the, the the worldviews of each of our stakeholder partners. So if we look in the bottom left hand corner, you know, we understand what the municipality delivers and focuses on. Uh, tourism is a piece which has been uh, integrated into the community for many years now. Um, but if you know, you pop over to the accommodation side there, you know, some of those providers may have decisions that are made elsewhere. And, uh, you know, we need to do a, a pretty good sales job to uh, help them, the, the powers that be, maybe if head office of a hotel is in Chicago, to understand what's happening in Delmont and why that hotel needs to be engaged at the community level. Same thing, all of what the industry needs in terms of product development. And then the whole holistic piece of destination management, there's a whole bunch of pieces there which require, you know, a strong tourism leader and their team to to integrate and be have a holistic view beyond just marketing, but building the capacity that we need to uh, to get high yield, but also ensure quality visitor experiences. Some of the considerations here uh, that started off this governance process. So, you know, we looked at the committee of council and understood that you know there's some efficiencies. Uh, there's some supports there. There's a, a strong municipal team that's been delivering tourism services for a number of years. There's some good sort of experience and equity there. <clears throat> um, going back to the Valmont vision in 2004, <clears throat> they were recommending uh, a non-government organization to, to deliver. And, uh, you know, we're kind of at a crossroads now where there's interest in the potential of an independent destination management organization. But the question is, is there sufficient support from the community, from the tourism industry stakeholders to actually undertake that, that implementation and transition from the uh, committee of council? Back in 2017, the Tourism Industry Association of BC um, put forth a position on governance that uh, a DMO should be governed by a board with local government representation. Um, the organization requires tourism expertise to deliver. Uh, they should be structured as nonprofits. And uh, the, the society or the board uh, supports management, but also calls to task management on what they do. Um, you know, the, the board would hire the executive director or CEO and um, make sure that they perform against uh, measurable uh, deliverables. So uh, this is the, uh, the, the, the lead or the guidance from the uh, TIA BC, and this is uh, best practice of what most DMOs are doing in um, British Columbia now. We did some peer analysis and uh, for, for tonight, I've distilled it down to these two examples. Uh, Destination of Soyuz is probably one of the best or closest examples to look at of a um, uh, 
uh, a destination management organization that um, has a similar size. They are a resort municipality. Um, you know, they are reflective of the diversity of experiences that uh, that Valemount has. It, there are some similarities in the Soyuz. And uh, we felt that the uh, the terms of references that they use and the way they operate their board um, would be a good uh, would provide good guidance in a direction that uh, they may, may want to follow. Uh, their terms of reference and a lot of that information is available online. And uh, I haven't spoken with the uh, the CEO of Destination Associates, but I know her well, and I'm sure she'd be very approachable and uh, provide some great feedback on her experiences there. Um, <clears throat> should the Glacier Destination Resort look viable and look like it might be developed, then another example that we looked at closely was Tourism Sun Peaks. Because, um, you know, looking at the current geopolitical boundaries of the, uh, of the municipality of the village, um, they're currently constrained under the Committee of Council and even going to an independent DMO, um, you know, that would probably provide uh, the flexibility to accommodate but the resort focused DMO that Tourism Sun Peaks provide, provides is another sort of map that we could follow in that, in that direction. So um, there's some flexibility there. There's some guidance here. These are sort of the best models that we came up with and uh, we delved into those in fairly good detail. We've got some, uh, some SWOT analysis. Um, I will just hit a few highlights here. Um, as, as I said, you know, the municipal employees delivering tourism services are, they're known, they've been working relatively well, they understand tourism, they have a strong team, um, you know, there's a comfort level there, you know what you're getting, uh, and they, they continue to have strong results even through um, the, the pandemic. Um, there are some opportunities there to learn from others, we can build some capacity. There are some potential weaknesses though. Um, you know, can the village effectively reflect the needs and concerns of tourism businesses and stakeholders? Can the uh, committee of council, um, you know, respond in an, an efficient way, an effective way, in a timely way? Um, the other issue here is that the committee of council was intended to be a temporary structure. So that's another sort of, um, bylaw issue that, that needs to be addressed. Uh, the other thing is, you know, if we look at some of the threats, you know, we get a new municipal election going on, changes in leadership, different priorities and focus. It, uh, it could disrupt the um, continuity of, of tourism deliverables uh, versus having a, an independent organization where, um, you know, the municipality can continue to influence and provide a voice for the municipal perspective, um, but uh, you know that there can be some some political disruption there. The independent DMO, um, you know, as we said, it follows best practices. It fulfills the requirements that the that the village requires, and uh, it also can provide some more in depth focused expertise uh, by having. Uh, a, a management team and, and uh, who are experienced uh, more specifically in tourism. Uh, the opportunities you can start from scratch and create this new organization that, that really fits the needs of Valmount. Um, and it can be potentially more effective in actually delivering building capacity and, and building tourism. Weakness of course, is that it can take anywhere from a minimum of one up to about three years to do a transition. And, uh, you know, there's, there's some additional overhead involved. So, uh, you know, sustainable funding is going to have to be um, anticipated and uh, determined. Threats, the biggest threat is hiring the wrong manager. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think that that's uh, a situation that occur regardless of whether it's an independent DMO or even, you know, if I mean, you know, Silvio has been doing a fantastic job from what we hear and see from other people. But, uh, you know, if he decided to retire and somebody else came in, you know, maybe the wrong manager comes in. So it can go either way. 
Um, so there's a, there's a bit of a, a SWOT analysis between both of them. There's a couple of things here to consider um, from our perspective as uh, consultants. Trust is probably the most important thing and, and trust is through leadership, collaboration, empathy, um, and having the right leader is going to be necessary. Hiring the right person uh, to facilitate that trust is going to be the critical key step. Um, understanding that the decision drivers, the worldviews, the needs of each of the community stakeholders for tourism. Um, and the, the, the great thing about having an effective leader is they can draw investment, they can attract talent, um, they can uh, herd the cats, so to speak, and get uh, people on board to uh, collaborate and pool resources. The, uh, the other piece here is that um, you know, the board governance is absolutely critical, following uh, detailed terms of reference, um, calling the, the, the managing director to task, having good board oversight in performance uh, is going to be critical, following Robert's rules of meetings, things like that. Uh, the discipline for that way. Uh, and then the other piece, which leads back to sustainability, is understanding that the world has changed in the world of tourism marketing, and it's, it's much more about management. It's about listening to the community, understanding their concerns about over-tourism and people who don't respect the community, trying to share their voice, uh, share their passion for their community, and share that with visitors and try to help visitors um, gain an appreciation for what is distinct and unique about the community. So um, our key recommendation, our priority option is to recommend pursuing an independent destination management organization model. Um, this aligns with best practices. There is a caveat though, and the, the, the main challenge here is going to ensure that we have sufficient interest and support from tourism stakeholders to provide that uh, time investment into uh, supporting the development of a new independent DMO. Um, and that's, that's going to be the key. Um, if that sufficient support doesn't happen, then our, our backup option is to adapt the current model to try to be, uh, you know, take the committee of council and act on sort of the concerns that have been raised about reflecting the voice of tourism and uh, timely re responses. Um, so, so that's that's the be the big sort of backup plan there. But as we said, the committee of council is designed to be a temporary solution. So, and a um, you know, an ideal scenario is to uh, work towards an independent DMO. Um, so how would we do that? Well, to set up a DMO, we would uh, have a transition over time, uh, rather than just sort of full stop, to evolve from the Committee of Council model, um, and what, and supporting independence and good governance, but maintaining a very strong relationship with uh, Council. Uh, there are different models, the stakeholder model, membership models, there's other types of models. In this case, we we believe that looking at uh, comparables across the province, the stakeholder model is the best course of action. Looking at the composition of the types of stakeholders and tourism businesses in the community, uh, essentially any business that is involved with the tourism economy, that could be the gas station, the grocery store, the tire shop that repairs RVs, anything like that, they could become a stakeholder no annual fees up front, and they would get a core set of benefits. The, uh, the more uh, tourism focused businesses, those that, that play more strongly in the tourism economy uh, would have the opportunity to pay to play. So essentially that's value added uh, pay per play participation in you know, trade shows, conferences, visitor guides, uh, collaborative content marketing, they would be using the network channels through destination British Columbia, Caribou, True Coat and Coast Tourism Association, Mountain Bike Tourism Association, Thompson, Okanagan, and so forth. So that is the, the uh, model. Looking at sustainable and secure funding, um, most funding options are actually available. 
within the current Committee of Council and Municipal model, um, the potential new sources can be transitioned. We may have further access, additional access to some uh, some additional funding options or, or deeper pockets, uh, having a, a more focused independent DMO. And the only one in there which uh, really would be other than new money from existing pools, uh, any sort of the, the new pool option would be nonprofit because it would be a nonprofit organization. So there are uh, some options that would be available there to help balance out the additional overhead required to create the independent DMO. So uh, this is my last slide, by the way. So this is a little bit more detailed. I won't go into too much on this, but I'll give you an overview of what a uh, transitional uh, a transition to an independent DMO governance model would look like. So for the, once the decision is made to move forward, I'm going to an independent DMO, it would form a transition steering committee um, with support of the committee of council, um, identify the new terms of reference for the organization and governance activities, um, get a note, uh, an overview strategy, uh, and so forth, and then uh, form a hiring committee and start to search for a new CMO, CEO, or managing director, executive director. Um, take some time, find the right person, hire them, uh, and uh, bring them on board. Um, you know, hold them to task on performance measures, uh, support them in what they require, and then have this person uh, initiate the development of the, the new nonprofit society process, creating the bylaws and so forth, um, and starting to develop the new governance model draft framework, get into more detail on all of the, the nuts and bolts, um, starting to expand the, uh, the tourism team, and then uh, probably, you know, at um, no sooner than about 12 months out, uh, we can actually uh, transition into the independent DMO. Uh, it may take longer depending on um, you know, how long it takes to, to find that correct candidate to lead the organization. So um, really, you know, one to two years, time to transition, transfer knowledge and skills, get comfortable with that, uh, keep the lines of communication going for the terms of reference, build the leadership and build capacity. And then, um, you know, I, I really envision that, uh, you know, a, a new CEO with an independent DMO organization would uh, be more focused on leveraging programs and resources from the regional destination management organizations and the province. So there's a bit of a, uh, an overview on the timeline. And uh, I'd like to open it up to questions. Philip, did you wanna sort of add any summary comments to that? Not much room to add there, Ray, that was great, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Can you share your slides? Yeah, thanks uh, very much. If we just have you not share your slide any longer, we can have a face to face. There we go. Awesome. There we go. Ta -da. Uh, motion to receive delegation. <laughs> Councillor Pearson, Councillor McLean, any okay. questions for the delegation? Comments? Councillor Blanchett. I just wanted to thank you both. Um, we've been going over this with you for um, several months now, and uh, it's really great to finally see it come together and how it's going to look. So thank you for that. You're welcome. Yeah. Councilor Pearson. Yeah, just likewise uh, to both uh, Phil and, and Ray and the rest of your team. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thanks for the work you put in. I mean, it's it's been quite the journey going through all of this, and uh, it's kind of nice to see light at the end of the tunnel. So thank you for the work. Thank you. Any further? Anything further? I did, uh, I was really appreciative of the, uh, your opening remark. Uh, be where the puck is going to be, not where it's been. Uh, nice little reference to the great one, so thanks for mm -hmm. that. Um, I suspect this presentation is available to council. The, the, the orange on white was uh, a bit challenging to see on the first couple of slides. The PowerPoint, I can you? That. It could be our it could be our monitor too. 
And then yeah. a question about going towards that more independent uh, DMO. Right now, everything is supported financially through bylaw. We have a hotel room tax that is set at 2% uh, funds from, from each of the operators are forwarded uh, to the province and then over to the municipality to be distributed within a budgeted amount through tourism bail mount. Is that what an overall independent governance, is that something that that would continue on in your mind? Yes, and the difference is in more in that the DMO would take care of the reporting and all of those other elements, but the funding still has to flow through the municipality to qualify for those, the RMI and uh, MRDT. Thank you for that. Um, my curiosity is satisfied. <laughs> uh, gentlemen, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to present this evening. Uh, I found the presentation enlightening. Uh, there are certainly uh, a couple of paths that we can go down moving forward. So thank you very much. Uh, you're welcome. And if I could offer a final thought, you have a phenomenal product and experiences that will appeal to a wide range of people. I think getting really well organized to be ahead of the growth that's coming would be um, in your best interest. Well, that, that being said, if you could just uh, whip out your crystal ball for us, uh, when do you see international travel uh, pick back up again? Uh, well, my crystal ball says we'll see U.S. travel start to pick up through the summer, but international is going to be later on in the fall. I think there's a few more vaccine things that need to get sorted out internationally before that happens, but everything's moving a little bit quicker than we expected, so I'd hesitate to say next year for international travel. I think it's going to come a bit earlier than that. Excellent. Thank you very much uh, again for your time and, taking, uh, and for your expertise this evening. Welcome. It's a pleasure. Thanks a lot. Have a good evening. Great. Good night. Good All in favor of receipt? Carried. Under 4.2, we do have another delegation from Mr. Derek Shaw on behalf of the Valmont Secondary School who presenting tonight to Council for a Pride Crosswalk on Ash Street. Mr. Shaw. Hmm. He was there. Ah. Can you hear me now? We can hear you now. It's the first uh, year on mute, uh, so I think it's a round of coffee the next time you see us. Okay. So good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, thank you very much for accepting our request to make this presentation to you tonight. I'm sure that you're aware that June has been designated as Pride Month. Recently, the well-known rainbow flag representative of the sexual orientation and gender identity community, also known as SOGI, has been altered in solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement to include black to represent diversity, brown to represent inclusivity of the indigenous community, and light blue and white, the colors borrowed from the transgender pride flag. Tonight, we ask that the village of Valmount consider installing a crosswalk on Ash Street near Valmount Secondary School that would indicate to all those coming to our school community that Valmount not only welcomes diversity and inclusivity, but we embrace it and celebrate it. By working with us to create such a crosswalk, where currently none exists at all, I believe this project would be a symbol of the town's commitment to being a diverse and inclusive community that strives to make everyone feel safe and welcome. In preparation for tonight's meeting, I learned a lot about crosswalks and some of the things that make some of them different from others. I've learned that there is a very long list of municipalities and cities that have now embraced this type of project as a symbol of support for everyone, more so than the creation of a safe crossing place. While a diversity and inclusivity crosswalk would certainly provide a designated place for pedestrians to cross, not all the crosswalks meet the standards set out in the world of transportation regulations. Some of the early pride crosswalks in several communities certainly do not, based on the layout and the materials that were used to create the designs. I wanted to know more, so I contacted Yellowhead Pavement Markings Incorporate, who were recently here resurfacing the existing crosswalks in our town. I learned that there is a special paint that is required, um, methyl methacrylate or MMA durable, that does meet the required specifications for Department of Transportation use. 
I've learned that it is also very expensive compared to the painting of a regular crosswalk. I was told that an average two-lane street crossing would cost approximately $400 to paint, where a crosswalk with 11 colors, as we're asking for, would be in the ballpark of closer to $4,000 to create. Uh, the difference in the cost, primarily due to the different paint and a lot more labor um, in the layout times. I learned that the lifespan of a material on such a crossing depends on many factors, but it would be reasonable to expect it needing to be repainted every five years. The maintenance of the material is not a factor, but as any highway paint, it will be subject to wearing and fading. I searched for a long time trying to find some data on crosswalk safety. Uh, I wanted to know if there were any differences in multicolored crossings versus a normal one. I contacted ICBC, but they do not have any such data. I did find a 2015 study that was done in the Old Strathcona area of Edmonton. They did a trial of numerous pride crosswalks in this, that section of town, and cameras were installed to observe how drivers responded. What I read was that there was an improvement in the number of drivers who stopped prior to the crossing at the pride crosswalks versus the regular white ones. The camera showed that drivers still stopped close to the same frequency, but more drivers were actually stopped in the crossing of a regular crosswalk. There were no recorded accidents involving a pedestrian in a pride crosswalk during that study. So as I shared earlier, I did reach out to ICBC and I actually got to speak with Ingrid Barlow, Barkop, sorry. She's the road safety communicator, uh, community coordinator for the North Central area, which does include Belmont. She told me that I could let you know that she and ICBC were very supportive of the village creating such a crossing to promote inclusivity and diversity. She made sure that I understood that not all pride crosswalks we see in all towns meet the standards of a safe crosswalk, but that is not always the number one reason for their creation. She offered the services of a road safety engineer should we want to proceed with this project and also recommended that we contact David Dean for financial assistance to a road improvement program grant. Um, so I think that I've kind of used more than my own fair share of time here tonight, uh, but before I open the floor for others here to make a few comments, um, in closing, I would like to say that I'm willing to do whatever I can to see this request become a reality on Ash Street. I know firsthand that inclusive environments are important. I know that all students need to feel safe, included, and empowered to learn. And that is that an inclusive environment will produce better outcomes, not just in a school setting, but in any organizational structure. A message of inclusivity can be sent verbally, with actions, or visually. And I ask that you, the Village of Valmont Council, seriously consider the request we place before you tonight for you to make your statement of support for diversity and inclusivity for all residents and visitors who come to our beautiful town to see and feel. I thank you for all your time and your attention. I'll open the floor up to some others who are now all of a sudden shy. <laughs> Uh, this is uh, Kiba Dempsey here. I live on Third Avenue. Uh, I haven't prepared anything to say. I was uh, surprised and actually realised I was going to be here today. So, um, but I'm full support of the uh, Pride Crosswalk. Um, I think that this community could do with a statement to everyone that we include everyone. Everyone is welcome. And uh, I know personally some people in the gay community in Belmont and who haven't always had good experiences. Some have and some haven't. Uh, I think this crosswalk would at least show that the community here uh, welcome everyone equally. And that we accept everyone for who they are, regardless of what they believe, their orientation, how they look. Um, so I think it's an important statement to make. And I think that we're a little behind in other communities. There's loads of places, Prince George, uh, Jasper and, and many more that already have rainbow crossroads for a long time and I think it would be beneficial for us to stand together with all these other communities and say that we have the same values, the same inclusions um, and that when tourists come here they can see that as a community we're open and you know, you know welcoming to everyone so that's why I think we should have something like this and I think this proposal makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah, 
I am shorter. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Um, as a member of the LGBTQ plus community and as a student in Vermont Secondary, the addition of a rainbow crosswalk or pride crosswalk would be uh, very welcome for me, especially for somebody who doesn't have a lot of um, direct support at home. Um, having that kind of symbol for inclusivity, for me anyway, would be very important and very um, welcome for my life. And I know a lot of other people who would also be very accepting of it. It's, um, it's the good way to show that despite maybe financial or physical barriers, we're all, you know, we're all people, we're all diverse, and we're all unique. And having that, even to that physical symbol, that physical representation um, that people can look out to and maybe find some invisible support from, I feel like it's really good and really beneficial. And I feel like it would help a lot of people. That's why I'm here. I wouldn't, if I wasn't here, if I didn't believe in it, I wouldn't be here today. I'd be home studying. <laughs> but that's my, that's my two cents. Anyway, I'm just 11th grader. But a very, very important 11th grader. Thank you, Alex. So that uh, concludes. Is there any other comments from the gallery? No? Seeing no hands waving at me. Um, certainly willing to answer any questions anybody might have or any directions or suggestions that you might send our way. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Shaw, for your presentation this, uh, this evening and uh, the additional speakers. Uh, really, really outstanding. Uh, motion to receive the delegation. Councillor McLean, Councillor Pearson. Questions for the pre presenters this evening. Councillor Blanchett. I'd just like to say thank you for doing the homework that you did, um, looking into the different uh, possibilities, the different paints, the different everything. So thank you for doing that, because that saves us some, some questions. Yeah, for sure, and Karen, I can forward you my notes if anybody wants to see those, or a link to the study of the Edmonton too. There's a lot of information in that one. Do you have a follow-up? No. Further questions? Uh, Councilor? Not Pearson? a question so much. Uh, yeah, it would be a comment. Because uh, I did notice back in the day of travel, we were in Euclid, uh, there are two schools that are side by side and the main highway goes through it and I think we counted seven pride crosswalks through that stretch. So, yeah, definitely doable. Excellent comment. Uh, what I can say tonight, Mr. Shaw, is that no decisions will be made from this delegation uh, this evening. I would encourage uh, your fact-finding mission find its way to senior staff here at the, at the village, and so that they can put it into a fulsome report for council at a later date. Certainly. Yeah, I'd just like to highlight too that uh, to me, it's more than just a pride crosswalk. It's an inclusivity and diversify, diversity crosswalk, um, much more than just a pride crosswalk. So. And again, I can't thank you enough for, for the uh, presentation this evening. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. All in favor of receipt, it's carried. Anything out of the, uh, anything out of the reading file folks would like to raise? Councillor McLean. I wanted to raise the um, City of Pitt, Me Pitt Meadows letter regarding the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's call to action 75, where they um, have written a letter um, and shared it with us. They've written letters to their MPs um, asking that the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's call to action number 75, where they call upon the federal government to work with provincial, territorial, and municipal governments, churches, Aboriginal communities, former residential school students, and current landowners to develop and implement strategies and procedures for the ongoing identification, documentation, maintenance, commemoration, and protection of residential school cemeteries or other sites at which residential school children were buried. 
This is to include the provision of appropriate memorial ceremonies and commemorative markers to honor the deceased children. Um, I, I would like to move that we support uh, Mayor Dingwall's letter and request the same of our MP. Seconder. Councillor Blanchett. Discussion? I'd be happy to write that. Absolutely, without question. And I'm absolutely certain MP Zimmer would be ecstatic to receive it. Mm -hmm. Any further discussion? All in favor? It's carried. Anything further out of the ring file? Councillor Pearson? Uh, yeah, the uh, letter from the Township of Spalam uh, regarding the uh, BC Hydro um, residential rate review. And I would like for, for Belmont to support this and I would move that we uh, draft a similar letter um, to look at reopening the survey and extending the review. Seconder. Councillor Blanchett, discussion? All in favor? Carried. That's 50% of the reading file. I mean, <laughs> there'll be something else in there. Of course, the uh, COVID-19, I'll just mention the COVID-19 restrictions uh, were well into phase, or sorry, step two of the reopening uh, based on uh, vaccination rates, first and second, uh, hospitalization rates, and daily uh, case counts. Uh, as of yesterday, I didn't catch today's announcement, but as of yesterday, we were averaging a three-day av three average of 78, so province-wide. Uh, and our vaccination rates for step two and step three, which due out on July 1st, uh, the vaccination rates were realized on June the 6th. So a lot of uptake. I know um, getting my, va my second vaccination today, uh, the, the community hall was extremely busy, mm -hmm. uh, especially around lunchtime. So uh, yeah, uh, looking forward to that July 1st target and hoping we can uh, move safely into step three. There's nothing else in the reading file. Administrative reports 8.1, 8 8 uh, that the Vilmont 2020 annual report being received. Councillor Pearson, Councillor Blanchett, discussion? Councillor Blanchett. Wonderful, wonderful report. Thank you to everybody uh, involved in that. It was fantastic and a uh, very good um, report from you. So thank you for that. You're welcome. And thank you, and kudos to staff for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any further discussion? All in favor? It's carried. 8.2, we do have a couple of recommendations from the Clean Air Task Force uh, and uh, their meeting summary. First recommendation here is that the summary report for the Clean Air Task Force meeting of June 15th, 2021, be received for information. Councillor McLean, Councillor Pearson, any discussion on receipt? All in favor? It's carried. And another recommendation here that council supports the CATF's, spin that into a word somehow, CTAF, C, C, no. CAF. CAF, there we go, CATF. Uh, development of a air shared management plan for the Van Mountain area. Councillor Blanchett, Councillor McLean, any discussion on support of an air shared management plan provided by council? All in favor? It's carried. 8.3, council payable report 2021. Let the report be received for May 2021 be received for information. Councillor Pearson, Councillor Blanchett, any discussion? All in favor and receipt, it's carried. <coughs> we do have some legislative uh, financial statement of financial information to receive uh, and the recommendation here that the council approves that statement of financial information. Sophie, Councillor Pearson, Councillor McLean, 
Any discussion on approval? All in favor? It's carried. 8.5, paving of 17th Ave. Uh, tonight we need to award a contract and there is a recommendation here that council direct staff to negotiate a contract with Dawson Construction Limited in the amount of $1,036,882.50. million for the paving of 17th Ave, subject to the village receiving a funding agreement from Trans Mountain for the project. Councillor Blanchett, Councillor McLean, discussion. There was some additional works, uh, 36,000 uh, ish dollars. What was that? Uh, uh, for your worship, that was in order to replace any sections of the base of the road that might need to be replaced that we're unaware of at this time. Oh, like substandard construction material? Exactly. Okay. Further discussion, questions? We're quite confident Trans Mountain will come through this time? It has been, uh, it's been made into a press release, so I, mm -hmm. I, I would hope that they would stand behind what they've, they've stated they would do. Excellent. Looking forward to it. All in favor? It's carried. 8.6. Airport Weather Station RFQ awarding of contract. The recommendation here the council award the Airport Weather Station contract to Code Project Enterprise Limited in the amount of 32500 plus taxes. Councillor McLean, Councillor Blanchett, discussion. You'll see from the report that Code Mechanical did our fuel distribution upgrade, did some beautiful work out, out there. All in favor? It's carried. 8.7, Centennial Park, washroom demolition, awarding of contract this evening, and there's a recommendation that council award the Centennial Park washroom demolition contract to KRM Contracting 2000 Corp in the amount of $7,500 plus taxes to be paid from the Tourism Dependent Community Fund. It's council's wish. Council, uh, sorry, Council Pearson, Council Blanchett, any discussion? I thought with the amount of concrete leaving that site, 7,500 was a pretty good deal. Yeah. Considering it can't stay here. All in favor? It's carried. 8.8 .8, Village Veilmont entrance sign maintenance. Request for quotes. Recommendation here that the report be received. Councillor Pearson, Councillor Blanchett. Discussion. It's frustrating. <sighs> Everyone's got work apparently. Mm -hmm. All in favor? It's carried. 8.9 portable changeable message sign uh, wording of contract. We have a couple recommendations here. First recommendation that council approves an increase to the portable changeable message sign budget from 18,000 to 21,000 from the COVID-19 safe restart plan as originally approved by resolution number 4221. Councillor Blanchett, Councillor Pearson, discussion. A bit more than what was envisioned. Not Does, a lot though, it's not oh, a lot. No. A uh, question for staff, does it have a, um, a, a speed sign on it, i.e. you are doing this amount, or is it just changeable message board? I believe this is just a changeable message board. Yep, thank but you. But it is, um, it's a, it's geared for highway traffic, whereas what we were originally looking for was uh, up to a maximum of 70 uh, kilometers an hour, which would have worked within the community, but this would, it's a little bit more versatile. Thank you. Any further discussion? Okay. Oh. <laughs> All in favor? It's carried. Second recommendation here that council award the portable changeable message sign purchase to Adronix Signs Limited in the amount of $19,250 plus taxes. Councillor McLean, Councillor Pearson, any discussion on the awarding? All in favor? carried. 8.10, 2021 Canada Day celebration. 
Fortunately, we do have a recommendation here that Canada Day celebrations be cancelled for this year. Councillor Blanchett, Councillor Pearson, discussion. Councillor Pearson. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was a very difficult decision for, for the Tourism Belmont Committee to look at, um, but in light of current events and um, and trying to run a fireworks display and limiting the crowd to 50 people and the logistics behind it, it was decided that this would be a, a time to just rest and try again later. And reflect. Yes. Any further discussion? All in favor? It's carried. 8.11, a purchase of an electric vehicle for bylaw enforcement. There is a couple of uh, recommendations here. The first one being that staff procure a suitable electric vehicle for village use by utilizing the CAREP funding held by the village. Councillor Pearson, Councillor Blanchett, discussion. Council Blanchett. They gave us a lot of information. Um, I think it's a great idea. Um, you know, um, it's an electric vehicle, so we have an electric vehicle's charging station. Um, and I think that for, um, for 2021, it's a good time. Yes, indeed. Councillor Pearson. Um, it will stand out in the community. It is a very unique looking vehicle, so. If it's that one. If it's that one. If it's that one. For sure. Yeah. No, it's good. Further discussion? All in favor? It's carried. I was thinking about getting one for the sand pit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there, there is another recommendation, Council, that funding for a stationary electric message board be allocated towards the remaining balance of the cost of an electric vehicle. Or that the COVID-19 safe restart grant be utilized towards the remaining ba balance of the electric vehicle. What is Council's wish? Councillor Pearson. I would move that we uh, look at using the COVID-19 safe restart grant um, and maintain the funding for the stationary electronic sign at this time. Is there a seconder? No second. It's quashed. Is there another motion to be received? Councillor Blanchett. I would move that the funding for the stationary electronic message board be reallocated towards the remaining balance of the cost of an electric vehicle. Is there a seconder for that? Councillor McLean, discussion. Councillor Blanchett. I just feel like um, our CAO just mentioned that the message board that we will be getting is going to be doing sort of double duty, lots of different things that it can do. Um, right at this point in time, I don't see why we would need a second message board. Further discussion, Councillor Pearson? Uh, well, I'm not sure that we. it would be a second message board. It would be the only one we have. And I look down the road at potential emergency situations where we're trying to evacuate people out of our community and need signage that we won't have, and we won't have this funding down the road. So the stationary board is different than, this is the stationary board, Okay. right? That's the second board. The one that we just put through was the big one, right? Okay. Am I completely confused? No, nope, maybe I was confused. So that's the portable changeable message sign board. The one that we just put through is the big one that's going to be on the highway, okay. correct? Okay. It'd be the portable one, yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. So nope. then the I stand corrected. Oh, okay. I stand right. corrected on that. I thought maybe I was confused. It happens. No, I, I was confused by this, <laughs> the order of things okay. too, so thank okay. you for that clarification. Okay. No worries. So we're good? Yep, we're good. Okay, okay. Further discussion? All in favor? It is carried that the COVID-19 safe restart grant be used, no, sorry, the funding for the stationary electronic board be reallocated towards the remaining balance of the cost of an electric vehicle. Got that, staff? Awesome. Bylaws and policies. Section 9, 9.1, Village of Elmont Cemetery Amendment Bylaw number 846, 2021. And the recommendation here that the Village of Elmont Cemetery Bylaw Number 685 2012 Amendment Bylaw Number 846 2021 be given third reading as amended. Councillor Blanchett, Councillor Pearson, discussion. All in favor? 
It's carried. 9.2, Village of Belmont Zoning Bylaw number 847-2021. Be given first and second reading. Councillor Blanchett, Councillor McLean, any discussion? Have a boo, it's first and second. Be heading to public hearing, I suspect. All in favor? Carried. Nine point three, Village of Vermont Procurement Policy Number Thirty Nine, Two Thousand Twenty One. Recommendation here that the currently current policy number thirty nine, effective November twelfth, two thousand thirteen, be repealed and replaced with the new procurement policy number thirty nine, twenty twenty one, and both were attached for your information. Councillor Blanchett, Councillor Pearson. Is there any discussion on the new policy 39 2021 for procurement? Big highlight right at the front. Everything's got to be pre approved. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it just gives some urgency on some of the purchases that were approved. All in favor? Carried. Are there any notices of motion this evening? We'll head to council reports. Uh, Councilor McLean. I had <clears throat> three events. On the 10th, I had a local government committee of the Columbia River Treaty Negotiations Telecon. On the 11th, um, I too was at the BC Hydro Operations Update with Mayor Torgerson. And on the 15th, we had the Clean Air Task Force meeting. What was that BC Hydro meeting? It was on the 11th. Thank you very much. I'll add that in. <laughs> Filling in the gaps. There's got to be a gap in there somewhere. <laughs> Councillor Blanchett? The 14th, we had a child and youth mental health meeting. On the 15th, um, I joined Councillor McLean at our Clean Air Task Force. I'm looking forward to that air shunt management plan. That'll give us some direction. Um, and so I think that's important. And one of the things I found that was really um, important in that um, Humira study was that they found that most of the dust that we see when you're coming out of the post office is not coming from the lake. And for years, I was always under the impression that it was. So for me, that was a real eye opener. So it's something that we need to address. Uh, the 17th was um, a housing meeting. Um, and as always, we're in a housing crunch. Um, I found out that we have people working um, and they are parking their trucks at the golf course and living in their trucks because there's nowhere to live. So not great. And on the 21st, um, I had the honor of attending the Indigenous Day Memorial Tribute. I don't think there are really any words to say anything um, other than I was um, moved and I was glad that I was able to be a part of that moment. And that's everything. Uh, Councillor Pearson. I went through my calendar twice. It came up pretty late this time. So uh, June 11th had the Trans-Canada Yellowhead Highway Association uh, annual general meeting, which was held virtually uh, just to deal with the necess necessary items. Uh, we're looking to do another uh, special general meeting later in the year to deal with re resolutions and stuff and we're hoping that it might actually be an in-person type event it'll be weird uh, the 15th the tourism Belmont meeting and yesterday the 21st as well also uh, attended the indigenous day uh, ceremonies both in the morning and the evening uh, for the opening of space and closing um, yeah Quite a day. Uh, June 9th uh, had an annual general meeting of the Northern Medical Programs Trust. He's uh, staying on another year as a uh, director at large. Uh, June 11th, uh, BC Hydro uh, operations call with uh, Councillor McLean on in another room somewhere. Uh, they got to really up their game. Like a, a telephone call and reading off of a uh, PowerPoint presentation is 
while informative, um, I needed to turn on the AC just to, and I really enjoy all things Ken Basket. Uh, with, uh, later that day, with the help of uh, Mr. Peters from VCTV, uh, filmed the step two reopening presentation uh, on behalf of the village, and I believe uh, Councillor Pearson did the same for Tourism Vermont. Uh, had a Prince George Regional Advisory Committee meeting on the 14th. Um, with the new programming through NDIT, uh, we are seeing, as, as, a, as an advisory uh, committee, we are seeing a lot more oversubscription to the funding uh, from NDIT than we have in the past. Uh, that revamp that you saw last September uh, was not only embraced due to COVID, but just embraced. Uh, gives a lot more flexibility for, for some of the uh, economic opportunities that are out there here in Northern BC. Uh, that same day, I had a, a briefing with Vermont Emergency, Me uh, Emergency Medical uh, Services. On the 16th, I had a VARTA board meeting uh, via uh, Zoom uh, with the relaxation, or hopefully with the relaxation, we're almost thinking an in-person meeting uh, for the third week in July. We'll just have to see how, the, how things play out uh, pandemic-wise. On the 17th, uh, it was a regional day, uh, starting off with the newly formed Connectivity Committee um, and the Regional Environment and Parks Committee and an open session with the Regional District Board. I too had attended the uh, National Indigenous Peoples Day event um, hosted by Ms. Mrs. Sherry Bobkey and uh, Ellen Duncan and what an event. Um, it was stirring, it was uh, a chance to look inside, and it was a chance to look to the future. So hoping to make some personal changes um, in my own life there. Today uh, was a big day. Uh, I met this morning with, if you recall, I did a, a, a civic leadership course last year, and we met with this year's um, course participants and a few of last year's uh, alumni and we actually had a call with the mayor of San Antonio, uh, Mayor Nuremberg. And San Antonio was one of the first major cities, like two million population plus, to sign the Compassionate Charter. So what that means is everything, every decision that's made at their council table uh, is done through the, the Charter of Compassion, whether it's from a budget standpoint, from uh, social spending. Um, and, and you saw things like um, you know, when, when they had the, the vast power outage in Texas, uh, the amount of flexibility that council gave to nonprofit groups, um, you know, opening of uh, massive spaces for recovery and emergency social services. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was a really neat conversation with them today. Um, really, really pleased to get my second dose of the vaccine. Um, well-run vaccination clinic, thank you Northern Health. And uh, it was 61 days to the minute. I had my uh, vaccine, my first vaccine on the 21st and 61 days later I had my second one. Um, Mr. Robinson gave me some time today to uh, review the agenda with him. And then we both uh, engaged with another briefing of uh, emergency medical services, or management services, pardon me. And then a reminder that we are still uh, under a statement of provincial, a state of provincial emergency. Uh, it has been extended to, or fingers crossed, before July 6th. So um, there is musings of Premier Horgan uh, making the, so the, the daily briefings are no longer daily with Minister Dix and Dr. Bonnie Henry. They are now going to a weekly briefing. Um, and next week, Premier Horgan will be joining the briefing, so we will see how good or not good uh, BC has been leading up to July 1st, so looking forward to that day. I think we all have over the last 15 months. Mm -hmm. So that's my uh, report. Motion to receive. Councillor Pearson, Councillor Blanchett, discussion. I'd just like to add something to my report. I'd just like to add a 
huge thank you to um, Mrs. Bobke and to Ellen and to Chief Loring for coming up from the SIMP. It was a big day, it was an emotional day and for them to take the time to come and be with us and to help us see, I think that was a really great thing for all of us and it was really great to see the kids there from the school. So it was just, it was fantastic, as, as fantastic as it could be, um, but it was really important to have those people there with us to help us see. I think it was Chief Loring was my first handshake in 14, 15 months. Yeah. And then I mean, the amount of work that, that Sherry and Ellen put into that was yeah. just incredible. So thank you very much. It's members in our community like that that help us get through these things, you know, and it's important. Absolutely. Yeah. It was an it was a, a outstanding day. Mm -hmm. Further discussion, questions, comments for the reports? All in favor of receipt, it's carried. Are there any public comments received this evening? There are no public comments, but could I make just a quick comment for the sake of the public? Sure. Just wanted to remind the public that there is only one council meeting in the month of July, and that council meeting will be taking place on July 27th. And we're really hoping that we'll be able to invite members of the public back into the council chambers once again. We'll let them know. That would be outstanding. Mm -hmm. I mean, we'll have to have gifts. <laughs> yeah. Like chocolate or a sucker. Uh, we've something. already set the five year financial <laughs> uh, No public comments received uh, other than a July 27th single meeting in July. I imagine it'll be a long one. Mm -hmm. Or not. We'll see how it goes. Maybe we might even have an electric car by then. Mm. Um, Go for rides. We're not proceeding in camera, so I'll take a motion to adjourn. Councillor Pearson.